Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thank you so much for joining us today. On the Logistics of Logistics, I talk to experts in logistics and transportation, warehousing, fulfillment, supply chain, and of course, technology. And during these interviews, I'm always the one asking the dumb questions. I ask the dumb questions so you don't have to. Today's topic is channel free logistics with my friend Bill Thayer. Bill is the founder and CEO of PhilLogic, a logistics as a service platform for retail that converts underutilized space at retail centers into tech enabled micro distribution hubs. Bill and the PhilLogic team are transforming retail logistics to meet the demands of modern customers. If you are a retailer, brand, logistics company, or real estate owner, this podcast is for you. So please take a listen. How's it going, Bill? Joe, thanks for having me. Good to be here. Happy holidays. Thank you so much. By the way, this won't air till January, so Happy New Year. <laughs> um, exactly. To everybody. <laughs> Bill, please introduce yourself and your company where you're calling from today. Sure. So I'm um, Bill Thayer. I'm the founder and CEO of Philogic. Philogic is a leading platform for local market logistics or what we call channel-free logistics. What Philogic does is we take underutilized spaces in retail centers, primarily shopping malls, and deploy the technology and the operations to help make those retail locations operate more as a network. So we work with not only mall-based retailers, but also digitally native brands to helping their logistics and their logistics technology operate more efficiently like an ecosystem. We're a B2B logistics infrastructure platform end-to-end. -end. We're not only servicing fulfillment, but it's reverse logistics, re-commerce. We're providing the solutions and opportunities that the retailers need to compete in what we call the channel-free logistics future. So happy to be here today and tell you all about what we got going on. I love it. I love it. So sp please spell Phil Logic for us. F-I-L-O-G-I-C. So logical fulfillment. Yep. What I'll do is I'll put a link to your LinkedIn profile, I'll put a link to your website and any other links you and your marketing team give me. One more time. You said channel-free logistics. I've not heard that term before until you said it. Please tell me what is the difference between channel-free and omni-channel like we hear so often uh, on my podcast. So I've been around the block a while. I've been around Omnichannel since from the beginning of my career over 30 years ago. Omnichannel is dead. Omnichannel denotes silos. It denotes different functions that are either tied together by different technologies, different operations. It is not built for the pace of commerce today. So when you think of somebody saying on the retailer side, I have a direct-to-consumer channel. I have a dropship. I have B2B. I have wholesale. Everything that exists out there as channels, one thing that I think we've all seen over the uh, last few years with the pandemic, the pandemic has shown that customer behavior and customer um, uh, requirements have changed forever. Um, their expectations um, don't really care about the retailer's problem. And the retailer's problem is omnichannel. You have an infrastructure that was built on something else that is very old. What we call channel-free is a customer-facing focused component of retail, but it's utilizing the existing retail infrastructure. So at Philogic, we don't look at channels, digital, physical, B2B, wholesale, whatever. We look at it as an ecosystem. And channel-free logistics is basically saying there's inventory and there is people and how you get that inventory to and from people. My head of engineering, when he looks at items and SKUs, he looks at it as an item without a context. An item moves through a system in various directions. It's just providing visibility and status to them. It's not an inbound or an outbound or reverse logistics. <clears throat> it's about looking at how do you make it most efficient. And when you look at channel-free logistics, it's about less time, less touches, less movements. And that is inherently faster, lower cost. And what's important to us, it's also sustainable and circular. It's about using existing infrastructure. When you look at shopping malls in this country, they are closely um, developed and built right where customers live. They're in the best traffic patterns, the best transportation areas. But what there's never been the uh, what's been always the problem is retailers don't operate collaboratively. Uh, when you look at some of the larger retailers out there, let's say Target, um, Walmart, they do a phenomenal job managing their logistics infrastructure. Why? Because they own big buildings. They have back of the house space, and they can easily support all of those what was called omni-channel functionalities. But really, what they're doing is channel-free logistics. Customer wants to entertain and interact with the retailer at their own level and at their own time. Could be digital commerce, 
It could be buy online, ship from store, pick up from store, what have you. What we're doing with Philogic is we're providing those technologies for everybody else. We're B2B logistics infrastructure, but we're agnostic. We're retailer agnostic, mall owner agnostic, carrier agnostic. We're about building an ecosystem because when you attach those ecosystems to mall of malls together, what you find out is you have a much faster, more efficient, and of course, more sustainable and circular network. Yep. By the way, when I think of when I think of business I, I said with products, I always think inventory. So we're we always talk about logistics. Inventory is more expensive than logistics, and so often on my podcast, we put the tail as at the tail trying to wag the dog. It doesn't work that way. The nice thing when you say channel free is there is no fence around this is for the Amazon stuff. This is for the our website stuff. And this is for what we send to this retailer. This is what we send to this retailer. It's saying, I have this many sweaters and I sell them. If, I, if they're all selling through this channel, I don't care. They're all, it's, ch- it's channel free in your mind. And, and again, we I've heard this on my podcast. People talk about it. Lean people will talk about this. 30% of what we make goes to waste. And it's very clear with food. We we have chickens that we grew from, from, from a chick into a point, and then we don't eat it because it went bad somewhere in the chain. Uh, Halloween candy the day after Halloween is worth very little. All of the Christmas stuff that we buy during the Christmas season and the Hanukkah stuff, all is worth a lot less the day after. We don't look at everything as perishable, but virtually everything is perishable. A brand new car that has no miles on it five years from now isn't worth as, as much as the next car. That's just the reality of it. So we have to start looking at it as how do we best manage our business to get the inventory to our customers? Correct. And, and unfortunately, you brought up Amazon. Amazon has built a phenomenal network. But that network, those buildings, that infrastructure, it's never been more expensive. Most retailers don't have the ability to compete. Like 10, 15 years ago, when I was working at other larger retailers, it was always, how are we going to compete with Amazon? Because Amazon doesn't make money in retail, right? They make it in AWS, they make it in marketing. So the way we look at it from a channel-free infrastructure, where do the, where's most of the inventory that retailers buy and own? It's in their stores. 75% of sales are still done from a physical location. So instead of getting all of that inventory closer to a larger distribution center, you need to get the logistics technology and operations closer to where the inventory is. Because if you're doing that, the ability and the long-term goal of what we do at Philogic is providing the solutions that make it easier for retailers to use our infrastructure to make their businesses more profitable to say, hey, I don't care about your inventory being digital or physical. You have a customer that needs it. And when you look at it on the outbound side, selling it, there's also the issue when somebody returns an item, and I call it sort of the shack problem. Shack's got a big foot. If shack drops something off in a C-level or a D-level store, that item is probably going to get marked down and is probably going to get thrown away. The idea to have a reverse logistics re-commerce infrastructure closer to that retail store, that makes it inherently better, faster. So when you look at that product being able to make it back into the infrastructure, that's why we want to be closer to the retail stores, not further away. And once again, logistics infrastructure and large distribution centers, the commercial real estate issue is not hit industry yet, but it's coming. It's just ex- too expensive to have these big buildings. Yeah. And by the way, somebody's talking to me about their location in Reno and he said, yeah, we're closing it. I said, closing it? This is, We're booming, right? This was a year ago. I go, How, what are you talking about? We're booming. And he said, I was locked in on I was locked in on what I could charge uh, a customer, and they were the majority of the customer. And he goes, and wages doubled. And he, and my rent, I don't own that building. My rent is going up, <laughs> basically hourly in in Reno. And going one step further, the guys working at that warehouse were driving forty five minutes to get to that job. And they go, why am I driving forty five minutes to go to that job? I, I it makes no sense. So everything just fell apart. And so somebody could say it's booming, but it, well, all there's a lot of people struggling. And I talked to the real estate people and they always say the problem that a lot of these warehousing companies have is they, 
they don't feel like they can raise prices fast enough because when they have to re-up, their rent is 40% higher. And so they have to call all their customers and say, hey, Bill, I got to raise your price 40%. And you're like, I'm out. I'm going to start looking for a new guy. That's the alternative is me raising your price basically once every six months when the when, when it ticks. Correct. And, and Joe, that's why we look at malls. And it's, it starts with malls. It can be anywhere there's aggregated retail. It can be strip malls. It can be power centers. You name it. What's most important piece is what you're talking about is what's made logistics so expensive because Amazon set the bar for what people will spend for buildings, labor, you name it. And larger buildings, when you think about these large um, parks of, of distribution centers, what do those building parks work for? They work for the parcel carriers, right? The UPSs and the FedEx of the world. Those are the ones that make the money because they're giving good rates to those retailers in those particular parks. But realistically, our whole point is we need to get closer to the consumer because if you're closer to the consumer, you're also con- closer to an employee base. Because when these big retailers move out of these region, out of these regions, the employees don't move with them. They stay there. And when you look at being able to provide logistics solutions closer to shopping malls, they're safe, good parking, good transportation to and from. Also, from the perspective, the mall owners, specifically the folks like Simon Property Group, who we work with, they've always understood there was a need for it. Because think about what malls are. They are platforms for retail experience, right? You started out with retail stores. Then, of course, you opened a food court because somebody had to go get your Cinnabon somewhere. And then it became, all right, so the experiential, the ball pit, you name it. But that fourth pillar, which is always missed until we came along, I think, as far as I know, was logistics. But logistics in aggregate. It's not about saying we are this retailer's logistics provider. It's about being able to provide logistics infrastructure and technology to everybody. By democratizing it, you have the ability to drive costs down and to make it more efficient because if there are logistics processes that, let's say, a retail store, whether it's located in the mall or within the region of the mall, that's where we want to be because we're providing the same processes across a broad array of inbound, outbound, reverse logistics, you name it, but that drives costs down and helps us build more of a network. That's the whole ecosystem play for us using mall. I love it. I love it. I, I want to switch gears for a second. We will come right back to Channel Free Logistics. But tell us a little bit about you, Bill. Where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to school? Some career highlights before you started this company. And when you're telling us, tell us also why you started. What hole did you see in the market? Because I've not talked to anybody who's doing what you're doing. Sure. Before I got out of jail. No, just kidding. I just <laughs> I had to throw that in there. It's got jokes. See if anybody's paying attention. I'm born in New York, raised in New Jersey. I went to college at a place called Colby College in Maine. When I got out of college, I actually, it's funny, I, I wanted to join the Marine Corps. It was my only love in life. I had a defect that kept me out of the Marine Corps. So I said, hey, you know what? I'm just going to go look for a job. And I got a job with what was old 9X. Also, Henri Bendel, I got a job with them. And I got a job with Macy's. And after never working in retail, I was a lifeguard growing up, I said, okay, let me try this. So I went through the bar training program at Macy's. And was introduced to that insanity. And Macy's is one of those great organizations. I spent seven years there. I think the best thing I got out of that place was my wife of almost 30 years. <laughs> um, but what was really interesting about Macy's is- Very good acquisition there. Exactly. Best thing ever. I'm not so sure. We're still trying to figure out why she has such terrible taste in men. But I think what was interesting about the Macy's bar training program is you get a lot of autonomy and they put you under a lot of pressure. So I was an assistant buyer. I was a group manager. I left for a period of time, uh, went to A&S, came back when Federated Department Stores took over Macy's. So I was in planning there. Uh, so I was primarily a merchant, stores, and planning throughout my time at Macy's. But after seven years, I went to an off-price retailer company called Lomans. And that's where I've spent bulk of my career is in off-price. If there's any off-price retailers or any off-price merchants, that are on this podcast today is off price is like the dumpster fire goat rodeo of merchandise. You buy something, you're never sure what you're going to get. And so it's all about the treasure hunt. So I started to help start a planning division at Lomans. But after a year and a half, I was like, I'm responsible for nothing and in trouble for everything. If I'm going to be in trouble for something, at least I should own it. And a gentleman, a guy named Bob Glass, who is the CFO of um, Lomans, my mentor, he's almost like another 
father to me. He came to me and said, you know, you're, you're driving everybody crazy because you're getting all your merchandise out of the building because you're a planner. He goes, why don't you come and figure out logistics? I'm like, I know nothing about logistics. He goes, I don't know it either. So let's figure it out together. So he eventually became the chief operating officer. I came on as a director. After a couple of years, I became the vice president, fell in love with that business, also fell in love with heavy automations, worked with a group called SDI Systems out of California, automated the business, took half the labor out of it, loved the technology of it because there was always the feedback that in off-price, you can't automate it. After you think of the process, I, I remember walking one of my buildings with the founder of SDI, a guy named Don DeSanctis, and one of my closest friends, a guy named Steve Haskell, that explained hanging sort of automation to me. It was like getting hit in the head with a hammer. Okay, so I can make this garbage pile of inventory, put it in a process so it can be sorted. Once we figured that out, took 50% of labor out of the operation. So because of the embracement of uh, the hardware and the technology, I then became the chief information officer. And then towards the end of my time frame, there, I was the chief operating and chief information officer. So moments I spent almost 19 years there, loved the place, loved everybody that I worked with. One of my two, two, one of uh, two very important folks in my life, a woman named Leslie Heller, who's now, who was a chief merchant for us and also Nancy Surface, who's the head of HR at Children's Place now. I learned everything about how to manage and develop people from people like Nancy and Bob Class. So great place. I have to say a lot of the folks that work uh, for me still at Philogic are old Lomans folks. Lomans went out of business in 2014. After that, I went and did some consulting. Hated it because consulting, you're not responsible for anything. They pay you and there's no responsibility. So after a period of time, I was working with uh, Century 21 stores. But I was also working again with Macy's. Uh, Macy's was building out what was called Backstage. This was part of the team that kind of helped develop what would be the future infrastructure of Macy's Backstage. But it was at that time, probably around 2017, 2018, I noticed that there was a big gap in how logistics was servicing physical retail location. Because when you look at most retailers, they'll say, hey, we're going to do fulfillment from store. They're going to take their WMS solution, and then they're going to deploy that in the stores. Stores have things called customers. Customers touch things. They move things around. And the processes, waving technologies, how you pick, it's all different. So I said, there's got to be something different that if malls, which are built for experiential, built for discovering, they're missing the logistics partner from an infrastructure perspective. I thought, saw that was pretty interesting. At the same time, I had taken a full-time job at Century 21 being the chief logistics officer, where I was at Century 21 from 2018 until 2020 when COVID took it out. But at that same time, we raised a little bit of funding uh, from a venture firm in New York City called XRC Ventures, who's invested in us three or four times. And so in late 2020, I jumped into Flogic. Even though we uh, founded Flogic in 2018, I was able to jump into Flogic in 2020. And we've been growing leaps and bounds ever since. But once again, 35 years plus in retail logistics, technology, e-commerce, and operations. I've got most of the scars to show for it. And I still keep coming back to it because logistics is a business that nobody wants to own. And understanding that in working at Lomans and Century 21 and, and other places, I said, well, oh, I'll own it. And the crew that I've worked with for 30 plus years, we've all enjoyed working together. We've built a pretty interesting organization and we're continuing to grow uh, channel free logistics. Once again, we're very pushy. Off-price people are always very pushy. So we're, I love going toe-to-toe -to -toe with people on Omnichannel, right? Oh, Omnichannel the, is the standard. No, it's not. It was thought up by a bunch of consultants that were trying to help their retailers figure it out. So hopefully, consultants, if you're listening, focus on channel-free logistics because that is the future. It's more efficient, sustainable. It reminds me sometimes when I look at like a fax machine, I'm so old that I remember when the fax machine was a really special thing at our office. I worked at an engineering company and I remember the boss said, only two people are allowed to touch that fax machine, Joe and the secretary. And I was like, and I remember when Ford Motor was one of our big customers, they come over, they'd show them, hey, this is our facsimile machine. And I'd be standing there all, if you need to send a piece of paper, I can send it. And I now look at fax machine as a transition to a better technology. And I think you can look at omnichannel as maybe something that's a transition to something different and better because 
we're always looking for different and better. And it, it, there's going to be a lot of different ways we get there. Agreed. Agreed. I think the, the main thing that I've always looked at, and I remember as an assistant buyer standing by that fax machine and ensuring that it A, went through, and B, I can confirm that it was received on the other side. Remember, Ed, you had to print out that that actual success message. And you said, hold on, I sent 20 pages through. They got 15. Which 15? Yeah. By the way, that that was where I made my bones because our secretary said the fax machine isn't working. Every time I send something, it comes out the back and I go, I, I think it's supposed to send it out the back. She goes, no, it's supposed to send it to Warren, Michigan. That was our headquarters. <laughs> and I was like, I think it like reads it or something. She goes, what? I go, I don't know. I, I, it does something. And then everyone's, Joe, it's supposed to go to Warren. I go, what do you think? It's wadding it up and sending it through the phone wire? I go, it's, it, it reads it and then sends it. Oh, and, and I, I think you're right. Is it, It's a step to the next yes. sort of future. Because think about this way. If I want to send a document, I'm going to scan it with my phone with an app. And then I'm going to email it or I'm going to text it. There's so many different modes. And when you think of all the infrastructure that had to go in, the lines, the infrastructure, who was going to man it, all that infrastructure, Omnichannel is the same thing. We've gotten smarter. We've gotten faster. But the difference is, think about that fax machine that inhabited a space. We're going to do the same amount of volume with a lot less power and everything in that same space. That's a channel free on the Omnichannel. It's let's use existing infrastructure. Let's use it faster and better and more efficient. And that will open up a lot of additional opportunities for folks. When you look at channel-free logistics, if you're optimizing inventory, you're making existing retailers' businesses better, right? Improving their margins. We're able to save retailers up to 50% of their existing logistics costs just go just by going through our network, right? A retailer one-time integration with Philogic, it means they can use our whole network as we continue to expand across the country. That basically means you're not going to go source another building Look, we work with 3PLs. We're more than willing. We're all about in a node on networks, the retailers' networks, the 3PLs' networks, the brands' network. It really doesn't matter to us. It's about the infrastructure and deploying that properly. Yep. Yep. So let's just, let's talk about who is your sweet spot? Who, who is the customer you work with? Sure. When you look at it, it is a mix between enterprise retailers, mall-based retailers, is also, as well as digitally native brands, and then also platform partners, people like Narvar with returns. Loop with returns. We provide them infrastructure that allows them to unleash the power of aggregation. That goes across everything because most retailers today, I think all of them will come back to you and say their biggest issue is logistics and logistics technology. The pandemic laid all of those inefficiencies bare to say, great, if I have a WMS, the WMS might be outmoded. And unfortunately, those enterprise technologies are extremely expensive. So whether you're a digitally native brand or a large retail, they all have the same problems. It's just a matter of scale. And through aggregation, we can solve both. So let's just use an enterprise retailer. So that would be one of the, would that be traditionally one of the guys we'd see at the mall? Yeah, correct. Absolutely. So what problems are you solving for them? So when they come to you, something's wrong because they're taking, they go, let's finally call that pest who keeps calling us, call them back. <laughs> and they go, Bill, help us. Why are they calling? What has gone wrong in their business that they think you could fix? Every retailer is in a different part of their journey. What, we, what used to be called the omni-channel journey. Now, of course, we call their channel-free journey. And our issue is stop trying to figure out how to fix it from 10 years ago. Fix it for the future. The ability to be able to do that is not by being a spot solution, right? There's plenty of platforms that would just do returns and would just do e-commerce fulfillment. As an end-to-end supply chain solution, we take the approach with a retailer saying, great, let us understand your problem because we're the logistics Swiss Army knife. And, but the issue is at that particular retailer's time, what's your big blade? What's the big blade issue that you need to resolve? Because you don't need the tweezers and you're probably going to lose the magnifying glass. By being an end-to-end supply chain solution, if somebody needs a last mile carrier, we have a network that integrates with those. If it is somebody that is looking to build out their e-commerce business, fine, we can support that. If it's e-commerce fulfillment at a particular time of year, we can support that as well. Because what we found that's pretty interesting is once we build an integration with a retailer, we're in the pipe. And so it makes it that much easier to be able to help them with all of these additional solutions. So we have one retailer whose name has to remain nameless, apologies, 
we started out doing e-commerce fulfillment with them for a couple months out of the year. Now we're part of their network and we do other things for them as well. Uh, when we first started the company, a lot of what we got feedback from the venture world was pick one thing and do it right. Retailers' problems are across the board. So we have some of our customers where we do 100% of their logistics. Right? We route their inbound, do B2C fulfillment, B2B fulfillment, drop ship, reverse logistics, re-commerce, sustainable liquidation of damages, everything. That's the ecosystem play because that is infrastructure that is not one-off. It's built for everyone. And as we've built out our own technology as well, it makes us much faster and more efficient to onboard additional customers. So I'll just give you a perfect example. Reverse logistics right now for us is a huge business because by being in the middle mile of what we, where malls are located, there's, of course, final mile. Nobody makes money at final mile, right? It's point to point deliveries. The people who make that is the parcel cares. We're purely focused in middle mile and middle mile aggregation. We found that by using our return infrastructure, 50 to 70% faster, which basically allows retailers to have 180% improvement on full price selling. Think about apparel retail. You're on an eight week markdown cycle. And if your return rates for D2C is 25%, it means 25% of your inventory is sitting in a box somewhere for almost half the markdown cycle. We do that quicker. Big benefit. Yeah, we know. I don't think people pay close attention to it. They look at the what's it going to ta- take to return that. Maybe more importantly, what is the carrying cost for you to have that sit at that customer? By the way, if I have to return something, it sits on my counter for a month. So we've got to get exactly. to it. And by the way, I'm walking distance to UPS, walking distance to Kohl's. So if I'm returning something to UPS, I literally can walk. And I should, (laughs) but I don't want to go. I don't want to stand in line. And by the way, there's not even always lines there. I don't want extra hassle. So correct. We've got time is important. And we've got to get to a point where we do a better job with the sizing. That's a whole other topic, but it drives me crazy that when I buy something and it's not the right size. And and, and that's why people, we find people bracketing. We're going to have to discourage people from bracketing. That's when they buy. I bought a large and I bought a medium. I bought one in red, one in blue each. Now I got four sweaters and we're going to turn three. We got to do a better job helping customers pick the right size. But that limits customers. Even, there's been a lot of folks that are out there that are trying to figure that stuff out. Okay, there's one option, which is just keep all the inventory. And if you're making enough money, that makes sense. But what happens when you don't make enough money? Amazon feels pretty comfortable saying, hey, hold on to, your, hold on to that inventory. Granted, their business has come back, but they still have a lot of additional warehouse space that they're holding on to. The idea is, how do you make it more efficient to do exactly what you're saying is, if I feel like I want to drop it off at a UPS store, great. But if I have somebody that's dropping something off for me and I want to drop it, like USPS does it, if somebody drops off a package, the ability to pick something up and send it back, being able to use those networks. That is a big portion of what we are focusing on because the ability to promote the sustainability and circularity of it is really where this needs to go. And that's a big part of Channel Free Logistics. Yes. And let's talk a little bit about your locations. I was on your website today. You've got you got a lot of locations with a lot more planned coming here. They're different. They aren't the typical warehouses out in an industrial park in the suburbs. <laughs> Correct. I think the most important piece with us is we're big believers that the mall business, the right mall business, is very good. Um, That's where we want to be, but we prefer not to take retail-facing space. We prefer to take space outside the GLA, what's called the gross leasable area. Truck tunnels, elbow joints, old demise department stores. If we have access to a dock or to a door, that's where we want to be. We also don't want to be, like, we can be in multiple spaces within a location that are not contiguous. The same, I wouldn't say disdain I have for consultants after being one. Maybe that's too harsh a word, but same thing on engineers in the supply chain are big fans of a 200,000 square foot box with 40 foot clear. I love those too. I'd love to be able to put a ton of automation in there, but the idea is we're using existing infrastructure that allows you to skip inventory processes, solutions into and out of those malls with limited impact either on the space or having to stage a lot of inventory. Most of our buildings average around 25,000 square feet right now. But we can go higher. It literally depends on the demand. And a lot of that is the strength of our relationships with our real estate providers. Yeah. And what's nice is when it's at that store, at the mall, 
The reason those malls got put where they're at is there was a big study done and it says, here's where the population is. Here's where the highways are all driving by it. Here's where the railheads are close to the airport. This is the perfect place for this mall. It's also, even though we don't go to the malls as much as we once did, it is also the perfect place to deliver from or to pick up and deliver. It's where our inventory should be close to our customer. If you're going to do same day, next day, you can't have inventory <laughs> long way away and say we're same day, next day. It just doesn't work. You have to have that inventory close to the consumers. And that's where the malls are, close to consumers. And I also like what you said is you're not looking for what used to be a store and you're in a storefront. You're using the, the back part of that mall, which I got to think- Non-customer if, face. Yep. I got to think a lot of those mall operators are going, perfect. No one wants that space. You're the only one who's called. Thank you. Get in here. I think the way we look at it is we don't look at ourselves as a retail tenant. We look at ourselves as a value creator. That is a big portion of what we look at from a business perspective. And once again, it's all about that ecosystem. It's all about that last piece of the retail puzzle, which is local market logistics, practicing what we talk about, these channel-free processes. That we That is what we think is the most important piece. Yeah. So when you say channel-free, and again, we'll, we'll use the Target as an example. I think most people are familiar with Target says, what, 90-some percent of the fulfillment is from their stores. No, there's no chance. So for them, whether we sell it today, somebody who came to the store or did a, a buy online pickup in store or picked it up at the curb or they delivered it, from their perspective, they might track what it is. But from their perspective, it all came from this store. And they're living the channel free life. They just don't call it that because they, they haven't had to. They've never had those problems. For the last 10 years, Target's been doing a phenomenal job. They, they actually, 10 years ago, they were actually outsourcing a lot of their technology. And they realized we understand the use cases of what our problems are. We are either going to acquire it. Like this is why Target bought Shipped. They needed to have somebody that was going to handle that last mile aggregation, which was smart. For Target, I'm not so sure how great it is for Shipped because they're trying to build additional infrastructure. Start buying additional infrastructure and you're just a sort carrier and a final mile, eh, not so sure about that. But the average company, the average retailer isn't Target. They aren't Walmart. They don't have locations everywhere. They have to, to somehow... <laughs> <laughs> they have to partner up, which is what I always say. It's a common theme on my podcast is you got to partner and you find a partner who can do what you guys do for them, which is again, it's getting their, it's getting their, whatever you want to call it, it's getting their inventory to the customer. And it doesn't matter how you're doing it. Now, are all of your uh, locations that none of them are customer facing, right? You don't have, nobody's coming into a, your location to pick up or am I wrong to say we, that? We, ha we have a few locations that are front ends for um, reverse logistics uh, to be able to drop off shipments. Um, we still look at that as a long-term goal as we work with mall owners because we want to be able to have a front facing location. It doesn't have to be a retail location. It could be a kiosk, you name it, where we could take any sort of returns. Our whole point is, being completely agnostic. Once again, this is why we work with folks like Narvar and Loop is we want to be the back-end aggregation and logistics engine that makes it easier for them to add more customers. Because once again, if you make it easier for a customer to say, you know what, today I'm going to send it back. Tomorrow I'm going to drop it at UPS. And then the next day I'm going to go to the mall because I can drop it off at that location. But what's interesting, if I drop it off at the Philogic location, my return is going to happen quicker. And in many cases, that credit is going to be handled and processed much more efficiently than it was in some of the other two modes. Once again, by being able to do the returns and the grading and the review of the product in that middle mile, just faster and more efficient. Yep. So let me ask you a question. You've got locations across the, the country. And let's just say you're helping me with fulfillment. How do you help me get my inventory to the right location? I, I need it at the right location so I can do that same day next day. And again, I, I'm trying to avoid what I always call, I, I think a lot of people call it fencing, which is I fenced off this amount of inventory for my Amazon business, this for my website, this for my retail, this for, this for. And the problem with that is I'm not 
getting the best utilization of my inventory. Correct. And that's the core of Omnichannel. I need to have, I have this item <laughs> and that item is in these particular channels. And so the way we look at it from a Philogic Hub is when we talk with retailers, we're saying, hey, do you want to do us to do forward fulfillment? Or do you want us to do what we call local market fulfillment, which is the ability to do store fulfillment, e-commerce fulfillment, reverse logistics, but also support existing stores in a region as the ability to offset split shipments. Our, our main goal long-term is retailers should not pick by store or pick by customer on any shipments. It's the ability to say what makes it the most easiest for a retail store, pick it in bulk and have a Philogic location 10, 15 minutes away that those can be consolidated, sent to a consolidated location to be able to do actual fulfillment. Just makes it that much more efficient. But everybody's in a different place. And this is why when we have buildings like we have some larger buildings that have eight or nine customers in them, because everybody's doing something different. But from our, our perspective, it's one solution that we are doing for one customer in one building. And we're doing it the same for another customer in another building. We're using that same infrastructure. It's the optionality to say, Retail has a problem with solution X. We solve solution X, but also improve A, B, and C by being in the network. Yeah. And I'm assuming it's easier for you to get employees given your locations, which is existing malls. It is amazing the amount of talent that we're able to, not only hourly, but also management talent. Because once again, as I mentioned before, when these larger operations are moving their distribution centers further and further away from the populations, then they're not moving those people. Those people have families, they have lives, they're not moving. Yeah. And by the way, one of the things somebody said to me not so long ago on the podcast is they said, everybody complains that they can't find good warehousing space close to customers. So they're opening up new locations. They said, first off, they're very expensive. Now they can't be nearly as big. So if I'm going to put something in downtown Chicago, downtown New York, that's expensive space. Even now with a lot of people moving out of the city, still expensive space. And got the regulatory hassle, big cities too. Well, in, in a lot of residential areas, nobody wants a big distribution center. There is actual, there is very aggressive local municipalities saying, we don't want a big distribution center. We don't want those big trucks all over the place. Sometimes those people are capitalists. And so you can't have the capitalists moving into your neighborhood. <laughs> What's next? <laughs> um, but what's interesting, somebody said to me- I love everybody, Joe. I love everybody. Yeah, yeah, so somebody said to me, that problem with the location is just the beginning. How many good warehousing managers are there? So if you're going to put up a big building, there, you, you can't go, hey, you know what? I would like to hire a guy who has 20 years of warehouse management ex experience and a, a 20 years of e-commerce. There's nobody like that. And if they were available, they're going to be wildly expensive. There's just not out there. It's true. It's, I never thought, it was funny when, when I took over as CIO at Lomans, I took over for someone that wasn't really happy. And he basically said to me, he's like, it'll be nothing more than a box pusher for the rest of your life. I'm like, that's interesting. So as I push you out the door and have a nice day. But when you think about it, all of us that have been doing this for 30 years, it's pretty funny. It's like, the so logistics is cool. I wouldn't say it's cool. I'm a logistics snob. I think everything is built on logistics completely. Yep. I, I, I will say, as long as you include inventory, because I always say, people say, hey, logistics is everything. Yes, but inventory is also everything. <laughs> so I think you've all agreed. Inventory, inventory doesn't get anywhere without logistics. Yes, exactly. Right? Process of moving th something through a system. I know I'm going to lose you at the top of the hour. Put a big bow on this. Why should we be going channel free? Oh, I think number one is cost, right? It's a lower cost efficiency. It's faster because we're closer to the consumer. And then one of the things I think is really important is the sustainability and circularity piece. Less touches, less moves means what we are doing to our environment, it helps improve that. And when you wrap that all together, that is what truly the future of channel free is. It's using existing infrastructure to support tomorrow's commerce from the infrastructure of yesterday, because unfortunately, what we're doing currently right now, too much corrugated, too much waste. You said the 30% that ends up in a landfill. We have just created so much and shipped so much that in many cases, doesn't end up in a good place. There's so much more that's happening in the middle mile. And I think Channel Free Logistics is a big contributor to improving it. 
and we strongly believe it. We've got, I think, some of the metrics to show for it, and we've just started. Awesome. Awesome. Bill, as I only interview the rock stars of this space, the people who are killing it, who else, people like you, who else should I interview? I think one of the things that's really important is we've got some great investors, Revelry Venture Partners, led our round, XRC Ventures, who I'd mentioned before, Closed Loop Partners, I love them, Groundbreak Ventures, but on the logistics side, Venture 53, run by Pat Martin and Dan White, they're big believers in what the future of logistics are. So when you look at folks like Better Trucks and Da Vinci Micro Fulfillment and Freight, that's F-R-A-Y-T and others, those are all folks that we work with, operate with, and believe in the same future logistics the same way we do. Yeah. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Venture 53 is a whole bunch of people who are executives in the logistics and supply chain space. Am I correct? You are correct. Yep. Those are folks that have... They get it. When you say, say something, when you talk about the problems, they are it is an abstract to them. They've lived those problems. Correct. Absolutely. That's a great group of people to uh, spend some time talking with. They know what they're doing. Excellent. So I'll talk to Pat White. Hopefully you can make the introduction. I know I'm connected to a lot of those guys. Pat, Pat Martin and Dan White. Oh yeah. I'm sorry. Pat Martin. I'm sorry. It's all good. He'll be mad at me. <laughs> what I'll do is I'll make sure we put a link to your LinkedIn profile, a link to your website and Appreciate that. You and your marketing team give me what conferences will we see you and the Phil Logic people at? Sure. So anywhere there's Vegas. So of course that means manifest. That means shop talk. We'll be at the lead. My head of sales will probably be kicking me. I'm missing a couple. Oh, home delivery world and others. We're always out there waving the channel free flag. I think it's important business and important work. Like I said, we're about working with as many people as possible because this is an infrastructure and ecosystem for everyone. Yep. Yep. I'll see you at Manifest. And by the way, I should say, for anyone who uh, is thinking about going to Manifest, I was there last year. Lots of shippers were there. It was 3,000 some people. This year, it'll be, I think, well over 4,000. And I don't know if you noticed, they, ch they changed the name to the future of supply chain and logistics. And I think it's a subtle change, but what it is, their emphasis this year is let's get more of the shippers there. Because uh, I always call it like the ladies night thing. If you say, hey, it's ladies night, what are you going to get? Lots of dudes, right? <laughs> and shippers want, logistics companies want shippers. Well, I, I think so much of it is logistics is the never ending battle of wheels versus walls. Right? Is it the transportation, ocean, air, or is it building operations? And realistically, the way we look at it on that channel free side, we don't care. It's how you move something through that system. So everybody that is, let's say, on the retail side or the brand or on the CPG side, they all have problems that in some cases you have a transportation provider that might have a facility that gives you the benefit. And they're truly more transportation side. That's why these conferences need to truly be more not just a transportation show or an e-commerce show. It has to be a little bit everything below. Yep. I did some interviews out at Manifest last year and I'll do more this year. And I also moderated last year the shipper panel. And I, by the way, when I got to the shipper panel, I was like, oh, look, standing, over, standing room only. Everybody's here to see me. And I was like, oh, wait, I'm sitting here on stage with shippers. But these were great shippers and it was very interesting. And we had Best Buy there. We had Alta there. Their heads of supply chain, everybody's at manifest. You really do get a sense of where the industry is going, and it's easy. It's easy. You stay at the, it's at the forum, and your walking distance. And by the way, a week at, later in the week is the Super Bowl. So if I see you there, Bill will maybe scalp some tickets, fifty, hundred bucks, go in and see the Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'm that lucky and I played rugby. Don't get me started on football player. <laughs> anyway, Bill, I love what you guys are doing. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Joe, thanks for the time, man. Appreciate it. And you're very welcome. I love having you. And thank all of you for listening to my podcast. Your support is very much appreciated. Until next time, onward and upward. You have been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage with leaders in the logistics and supply chain community. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, hit the like button, and leave us a nice review on Apple or Spotify or wherever else you listen. Also, please check out our videos on YouTube and connect with us on LinkedIn. We're very big on LinkedIn. And you can also reach us on the logisticsoflogistics.com, our website.